She was depicted as the dragon lady of the recent political campaign. Tonight we're going to hear her side of the story, which is uh, much different. Ariana Huffington is with us later in the show. Uh, did you know that some ancient Roman statues had removable wigs? I didn't know that. I didn't even care about that. But it's a fascinating subject. Everything about hair. Fashion historian Mary Trasco is here on Straightforward. Stay with us. She was vilified in the press as the controlling force behind her husband's recent bid for the Senate. She'd been called power hungry, been branded by many as the Republican version of Hillary Clinton. Now that I hadn't heard, that is terrible. She's, uh, however, speaks four languages, has a master's degree in economics, uh, a TV talk show host, a lecturer, uh, and a congressional spouse. Here with us, Ariana Huffington. Ariana, welcome to the show. Thank you, Roger. Uh, I don't think I ever heard of anybody being attacked as much as you were attacked, and your husband, but frankly, you took as many hits as he did in this last race. Why do you suppose, was that just politics, or was there some deep-seated fear about you getting there? I don't think it was personal. I think it was very much about uh, the rigor mortis, if you want, of the liberal ideology which we see going on now. It's Newt Gingrich now. It's no longer the Huffington. No, he has not had one good story. He has not. And take the latest story on him in The New Yorker this week. It's unbelievable, comparing his speeches to the Khomeini sermons. Uh, the word brutal being used all the time, carnivorous, uh, mean-spirited. It was very much the same words being used in a different context about me or Michael. Part of the reason, Roger, I think, is that Michael made replacing the welfare state a central theme of his campaign. It happens to be something I passionately believe in. I've written six books, two of which deal partly with politics and the need to reduce government, empower individuals. I approach it more from the point of view of the culture, the individual, revitalizing our communities. I'm not really interested in policy. And that's kind of the other way in which the comparison with Hillary Clinton breaks down. So, some would say, though, that because you're very rich and your husband's rich, uh, that it's easy for you to say, let's get rid of welfare. Uh, how do you answer those critics? Well, what I say is that it's not a question of getting rid of welfare. It's a question of acknowledging that the system is broken, that it hasn't worked. It has really damaged the very people it's supposed to be helping. After $5 billion spent, trillion, I'm sorry, $5 trillion, we can't even imagine what that figure is like, yeah. spent on welfare in the last 30 years, everything is worse. Violent crime, um, homelessness, poverty. And the very people who are supposed to help are the ones whose lives are being destroyed. So when, we, when I talk, from my point of view, of the need to empower those people, I'm talking about each one of us taking social responsibility, getting involved, a much more active definition of what it is to be an American citizen. One of the criticisms of you is that you uh, speak about volunteering, but you don't volunteer yourself. I volunteer a lot. In fact, during this campaign, Wherever I was going to speak, I would ask my scheduler to try and put me somewhere, in a homeless shelter, a soup kitchen, where I could actually do something, not be given a tour, but do something. I would often take my two little girls with me. They are three and five. And I believe it's very important to encourage children early on to volunteer. On top of it, I started the Partnership for Children in Santa Barbara County. My husband donated his uh, congressional salary to this. Our goal is not just to help children in need, but to encourage volunteerism in the community. Your book is called The Fourth Instinct. What, is that, uh, what does that mean? Well, the first three instincts are survival, power, and sex. The fourth instinct... Not necessarily in that order, depending on <laughs> who you are. Depends on how you're feeling. Apparently, I mean, uh... Depends on whether you're in the middle of a campaign or not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that cuts back on the old sex life, I'll tell you. <laughs> so the fourth instinct is... Uh, the instinct to reconnect with God, and the instinct to make a difference in the lives of others, to make service a central part of our lives. It's really the instinct that we need to activate if we're going to solve the major problems facing us. It's what Lincoln called uh, activating, encouraging, awakening the better angels of our nature. 
Are you a born-again Christian? You were Greek Orthodox? Is that how you were raised? Uh, I'm Greek Orthodox still. Uh -huh. You can be born again in the context of the Greek Orthodox Church. You can? Yes. Uh -huh. What it really means for me is uh, recognizing the strength of that personal relationship with uh, Jesus Christ. Did Jesus Christ cost you this election because... Uh, you know, once they tagged you as a born-again Christian, they immediately, the media immediately tags on right-wing crazy after that. And so did Jesus cost you the election? <laughs> no, I don't think so. I'm really very much a fatalist about life. I believe that nothing happens by accident. One of my favorite parts of the Bible is that verse that says, not a sparrow falls, but that God is behind it. And often we don't know why things happen. Something may look bad, and then two years later we look back and we see it in a completely different context. So my faith gives me that absolute trust that uh, everything has a meaning, even if I can't see it right now from my limited perspective. Did your husband take the loss that easily? Well, it doesn't mean that you take it easily, but it does mean that you put it in perspective. And of course, as you may know, uh, Roger, the, it's not over because of all the allegations of voter fraud in California. But whatever happens with that particular quest, the truth is that there is some purpose beyond the result of this election. And the fact that he made this whole campaign a referendum on the role of government, the fact that he did talk about bringing God back in the public square, prayer back in the schools, all those issues are really very much uh, part of the public debate now as a result of this campaign, especially in California. The uh, prayer in the school, though, the, the, the people feel that there's a, there needs to be this separation of church and state, that the second you get into mouthing a prayer, and I happen to think that a moment of silence is nobody's business. I, you know, who cares? It, everybody should have a moment of silence. We should have a lot <laughs> more moments of silence. If we could get Congress to, to handle a few moments of silence, it would probably improve things. Uh, but I can understand people who say you don't want to voice a prayer because it might be awkward for somebody who doesn't believe that. Do you agree well, with that? Well, you or? mentioned Congress. Well, Congress starts its deliberations every day with a moment of prayer. It's really not... Well, if there's ever a group that needed it, it's that group. <laughs> so I'm very much in favor of those guys doing but it. But so do school children. I agree. It's not, and it can be done without offending any religion, whether you're Jewish or Muslim or Christian. It's more like holding hands and saying grace before a meal or a moment of thanksgiving. You don't pray to any particular God. And children themselves want it. Mm -hmm. The famous case recently of the headmaster in Jackson, Mississippi, who was expelled because he allowed children to say a non-denominational prayer over a loudspeaker. Mm -hmm. Well, there does seem to be a correlation between uh, God going down in the classroom and the number of guns going up. I don't know quite what that is, but there seems to be some correlation to that. Absolutely. Well, as an immigrant, as you can hear from my accent, I was not born in this country, a legal immigrant. Mm -hmm. I have been fascinated by the Founding Fathers. And there is no way you can read what the Founding Fathers wrote and believe that you can continue to have a thriving democracy without very fundamental values on which this country was founded. And that's not to mouth platitudes. We need to live those values, integrate them into our everyday life. And that's part of what I'm trying to do with this book. What was the most hurtful thing that was said about you during the campaign? The most hurtful thing, it was both hurtful and kind of funny, if you know our household, because my Greek mother lives with us, was that I keep the refrigerators locked so that my <laughs> staff does not eat the food. Now, the problem we have is that most people are feeling force-fed in our house. You know, my mother uh, will not allow a mailman to deliver something without sitting down and saying, Sit down, come and eat I'm something, sure. look what I just made. Yes, it's cultural. They, you, it's they, cultural. They're insulted if you don't eat. I know, exactly. I've been to too many houses like that. I, I ought to move in with you guys for a while. <laughs> if you lock your refrigerator, I'd feel it'd be better. Uh, what about the idea that your husband was a lightweight and you were the brains? You were the one driving this, manipulating this. Did that bother you? It didn't really bother me, actually. But what is interesting about that is the double standard. If you are um, the wife of a Democratic candidate and you are intelligent and you have ideas and you talk about them, then this is something to be commended. If they don't like your ideas, then this is something to be disparaged. In the same way, if you are a Republican and you talk about volunteering and taking care of those in need, this is supposed to be out of touch and new age. If you're a Democrat, this is supposed to be compassionate. So the double standard in this race was unbelievable, and I'm doing a book on the race now. 
And um, I think I may call it, uh, where was Mary, Pop Mary Poppins when I needed her? <laughs> <laughs> We're talking with Ariana Huffington. The book is called The Fourth Instinct. And um, it's called The Call of the Soul. Now, you've been accused of being a, a member of a cult. We want to get into that. And uh, you've also said that the nerve center of your existence is the bedroom. As I recall. Oh, Is that really? true quote? <laughs> I don't know if that's true. That's what they said. But we'll find out about that right after these messages. A short time ago, this woman that's sitting with me was a witch, very dangerous to America, and here she is. We find out she's uh, very attractive, very talented, very smart, and doesn't appear particularly dangerous at <laughs> all. Isn't that anything well, dangerous it's, it's yet? <laughs> <laughs> the show is not up. <laughs> um, what about the press in this country? Uh, did they, I, I'm, I'm positive you don't feel they treated you fairly because, uh, frankly, I didn't think they treated you fairly and I know a lot of good reporters who said to me privately they have never seen a hatchet job like the one that was done on you uh, in this last campaign what do you think I mean are they out of control or uh, do you think this was a, an aberration no I don't think it's an aberration but I think it's a particular turning point in our history and what has happened take what happened on November 8th most of the Democrats like Mario Cuomo, Tom Foley, were vaporized. But their equivalents in the press are still there. The Sidney Blumenthal's, the Maureen Orths, you know, the Tim Russert's, they're still there, the pandits. So there is, that, uh, there is that moment in our history where the people who are talking and listen to are in total disagreement with the electorate. And you have the spectacle of Peter Jennings writing a column in which he accused the electorate of having a temper tantrum. Yes, I saw that. And yes. he went on to say, are we now going to be governed by two-year-olds having a temper tantrum? This elector needs more parenting. And who is going to do the parenting? Is Bill Clinton going to be dad and Jocelyn Elders is going to be mom? <laughs> you know, it, and who is Peter Jennings yeah. to tell us that we need parenting? You know, just because he can read um, a teleprompter and he looks cute on TV, you know, who else gave him the authority to and really attack the electorate. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the accusations that you are a member of some cult, tell me about that. What's that mean? Where did, where did they I get that? I write in my book, in fact, the introduction to my book uh, is about the fact that as many of my fellow baby boomers, I had a wide spiritual search. Ever since I can remember, I had that longing to reconnect with God in a very real way, very tangible way. I remember when I was three years old, kneeling by my bed and praying to the Virgin Mary. And then I did seminars, retreats, asked insight. Uh, I walked on hot coals to try and prove mind over matter. I went to India and sat at the feet of gurus. None, none of that is a secret. I mean, I wrote about it. That's partly what but a lot of liberals did that in the 60s. Yes. I mean, a lot of, uh, so it wasn't just, you were not even a Republican at that time, right? Well, I, I wasn't really a member of any particular party. Mm -hmm. But for me, this was a quest. I never belonged to any of these things. Mm -hmm. Part of it was my own intellectual curiosity. I always knew I would be writing a book on this spiritual instinct. Part of it was my own personal longing. The point is that this search for me came to an end in 1987 when I returned to my own religion in a more mature and profounder way. So I never really understood what this whole press witch hunt was about, because it was a witch hunt. It was really guilt by association. A, MSIA is not a cult, but B, even if they wanted to portray it as a cult, the fact that I had taken seminars with John Roger, had read his books, was neither here nor there. Who is John Roger? John Roger is the head of MSIA. Oh, I see. The irony here, Roger, is that I have written six books where I express my own views. So. If they wanted to attack me for any of my views, for anything I have said in books, in speeches, in articles, that would have been fair enough. But they never did that. 
They never pointed to a paragraph, a sentence, that they wanted to castigate me for. It was always that guilt by association. Well, even if you did believe in this, uh, it seems to me there was something in the Founding Fathers about uh, freedom of religion here in this country. And uh, as I recall in the, in the race in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. the race turned when Teddy Kennedy attacked Mitt Romney's yeah. religion. Uh, would you say your race turned when they went after you on there religious was, grounds? There was a definite backlash, yes. Mm -hmm. Because when you had David Wilhelm, mm -hmm. the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, and Bill Press, his equivalent in California, actually going out and attacking a candidate's wife for her religious beliefs, I think the majority of people were disgusted. Mm -hmm. Feinstein herself attacked me on this, gr on this ground. So, but that's again a larger question. They have so totally lost the war of ideas mm -hmm. that character assassination is going to become their weapon of choice increasingly. Mm -hmm. What else do they have? Feinstein never attacked my husband on anything that he believes. What could, what could she have attacked him on? You know, lower taxes or tougher on crime? You just said that uh, you think this character assassination is going to get worse. How, what do you mean? Do you think we're in for more of this? Yes, uh, uh, absolutely. You see it with Newt Gingrich. You're beginning to see it with Dick Army. Any of the key Republicans now in this revolution, because if it's going to work, it's going to be a revolution. Our country's not going to look the same when this is over. So they're going to do everything they can to discredit it, to scare people, to make them feel that there are going to be children going hungry in the streets, to make them feel these people don't care that they're mean-spirited, and they're going to try and find everything in their past. And if they don't find it, they'll fabricate it in order to discredit them. I have no doubt about that. And we have to fight back. We can't just let that happen. You really sound as if you think it's a press conspiracy. No, no, no. It's, I don't believe in conspiracy theories. I think it's much more dangerous than that. I don't believe they all get in a room and say, let's get Newt Gingrich or let's get Arianna Huffington. I think they are so... Uh, adamant about what they believe, and two things in particular. They really believe in big government. It's not a, a question of them thinking that it's a better way of doing things. They believe in it. And the other thing is the place of God in the public debate. Okay. We'll be right back with Arianna Huffington. We've got to take a break. Stay with us. Are you going to make my wife's personal religious Your wife beliefs is not part of this campaign? Well, yes or no? Michael, what I am yes. trying to... is a Republican congressman, I nearly voted for Ospero, not because I really believed in him, but because he was the only presidential candidate who did not jog. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. That's you on politically incorrect? Is that what that was? Uh, Liz Smith said that she, he's always trying to heal me, meaning John Roger. What's she talking about? I think she met him a couple of times, uh -huh. a long time ago in New York, and I don't quite know what she's talking about, or, or what the relevance of it was to... Um, whoever. What is John Rogers' message? What is he trying to say? His message is very much based on uh, Christ's message. It's very simple. It's about uh, taking care of others, not just of ourselves. It's the message of moving beyond our own self-centeredness. Does he believe he's somebody strange, or does he believe he's the son of God, or God's other son, or...? I've never heard him say that. I've okay. never read it in his readings. Okay. Uh, God's Other Son happens to be Don <laughs> Imus' book. He wrote about a, a book which is a horrible book that you should buy if you want to laugh, but it's not, it's, it's a horrible book, but it's funny. Um, the, the, I had a quote earlier that you said you looked a little puzzled, but it said in the Washington Post uh, in 1987, the nerve center of your, your existence is the bedroom. <laughs> Is this? In 1987, I was newly wed. Oh, <laughs> so during that time, the nerve center was the bedroom. Well, we married in 1986. I don't know if I, exactly I said that. But I must say, I do love to read a lot in bed. I love to make calls in bed. I love, I think, Go the on. whole idea. Go on. <laughs> the Go whole... on. <laughs> Go on. This is an X-rated show. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I'm just so far calls and crackers and uh, reading. Well, uh, other than all the obvious things. Okay. You know, Antonia Fraser in England, who writes novels and biographies, yeah. writes her books in bed. Yes. And when I wrote um, a book on Greek mythology, I took... That would really ruin a guy <laughs> if he's trying to make love to you and you say, 
Let you're, me finish this you're, job. You're, wait, I, I just got to finish this one sentence. I mean, kind of throw the old timing off, wouldn't it? Jeez. It's a kind of the equivalent about, of foreplay, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> it's a birth control, some kind. Uh, what is your mission? Uh, the critics will say your mission is self-promotion, that you're really a promotion-minded person, you're a marketing, you're really a very good marketing person, uh, and that, that all of this stuff about volunteerism and all these other things are really a promotion mechanism. How do you counter that? Only by what I have done and what I have written. I don't think I can counter it by what I say. But anybody who looks at the books I've written, going back to when I was 23 years old, I'm now 44, Wow. And when I wrote my first book, uh, it was called The Female Woman, Random House, published in America. And it was against the extremism in the feminist movement. It was attacked because at the time, you may remember, everything was black and white. You're either a total feminist or you're against the movement. And what mm -hmm. I was saying is that... We'd, That's no, Phil no, Donahue's I'm... position, basically. <laughs> yes, I know <laughs> Phil. He's a good friend of mine. But uh, he does have that position. Either you're prepared to take orders at all times from women, <laughs> or you are... A misogynist. <laughs> That's right. So that was controversial. Mm -hmm. My second book, which did not, was not a commercial success, but it was in favor of integrating a spiritual dimension in our culture and reducing the role of government. It was a very academic book, but it was controversial. Mm -hmm. My third book on Maria Callas was not particularly controversial. My fourth on Greek mythology was not, but my fifth on Picasso was very controversial. Well, you said uh, he was homosexual. No, no, I didn't say he was homosexual. No, no. Somebody I said told that me that. He, I said that um, that he had had a homosexual experience when ah. he was younger, mm. and I said that because Francois Gillot, who was his mistress for ten years and very close to him, had been told that by himself. Ah. So it was not a speculation, it was really from... But you were uh, criticized for saying that, is it? No, but I was, I was mostly criticized for saying that he was not a great artist. I said he was a great genius, a great craftsman, but for me the greatest of artists give us a sense of light beyond the darkness, and he never did that. Mm -hmm. That's not to question his genius, but mm -hmm. the critics could not stand that. And on top of it, the cry went up, how dare you, and who are you? you know, well, it seems to me that you've had some strong opinions in your life, and every time you get in trouble, it's because you have a strong opinion. And especially a strong opinion that's not part of the conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. Now, later on, it becomes part of the conventional wisdom, like on the question of feminism. Betty Friedan herself... She's kind of uh, later, backed away from absolutely. some of that stuff. She wrote the second stage, and it was all... Uh, the feminist movement maturing and growing up. Well, I think she felt felt that they perhaps went a little too far. You know, uh, at some point when you get a little older, it's kind of nice not to have all men hate you. And I think that's what <laughs> happened to some of these feminists. They went in there and got so angry, they got so anti-male, that then they got a little older and wanted to be... Uh, loved again. Uh, loved again and uh, have Held somebody again. hold the car door open and there was nobody around to do it. Not to mention the nerve center of their existence. That's right, the, the nerve, the old... <laughs> The old bedroom shut down, too, I think, with a lot of them. Uh, do you think that the feminist movement has gone to an extreme, or do you think that it's leveling out, or where do you think it is now? Well, there are always extremists still in existence, but on the whole, I think it has leveled out, partly because a lot of women, a lot of older women like me, acknowledge their tremendous longing to have a child. I, had, I didn't get married until I was 35. I lost our first child, so I didn't become a mother until I was 38. And my second child was born when I was 40. Well, it was the best thing that ever happened to me. I mean, there's nothing in my whole life to compare with the experience of being a mother and bringing up these two little children. Was it, uh, is it a, a concern of yours that these kids are going to grow up in a different world than you did? Yes, but I don't want them to grow up in the world I grew up in. I'm not idealizing the past. I do not believe there was a golden age. I think the golden age is ahead. I'm idealizing the future. But in order to get there, we have to make it happen. It's not just going to happen by itself. And we have to stop thinking that government is going to do it for us. What's the biggest shock uh, that you encountered in motherhood? The biggest shock? <laughs> well, the biggest shock is the way my children related to this campaign. Really? Uh, my five-year-old was totally involved. She started introducing herself as Christina Sophia Huffington for Senate. <laughs> <laughs> she had heard Huffington for Senate so much, she thought it was part of her name. <laughs> That's great. Uh, we have one more segment. Here's the book, <clears throat> The Fourth Instinct, Simon & Schuster. You can pick it up at your bookstore now. Uh, 
We're going to talk a little bit about volunteerism after this break, and can it save America? Ariana Huffington, stay with us. In the last century, the pursuit of happiness has been reduced to the pursuit of pleasure. And I'm hoping in this essay to redefine it, to include the pursuit of a personal spiritual fulfillment and the pursuit of service to others. You know, Ariana, we have a program on this network called Have a Heart because, uh, and it's about volunteerism. I've People, been on it. Yes, and we, and uh, you know about the show. And yesterday uh, they had some toys stolen. Some kids here somewhere on our show managed to get ten thousand dollars within an hour, I think, to get all the toys replaced that were stolen mm. in the Bronx or wherever it was. And and uh, I, I really invented that show for this network because I've long believed. That if we if we wait for the federal government to solve all our problems, we're going to be in deep trouble. But if we all individually, every day, get something done for somebody else, that uh, somehow this will be a better place. Now I realize that that's sort of a naive uh, view in this day and age. Uh, what do you think could be done with volunteerism if people really went at it? Is it a pipe dream? No. First of all. I don't think it's naive at all. And if you look back through history, some of the greatest thinkers, whether it's Edmund Burke or the Tocqueville, or in fact the founding fathers, believed that was going to be the solution. Mm -hmm. When Edmund Burke talked about the little platoons, that's what he had in mind, communities, individuals, churches, synagogues, getting together and doing something to help uh, solve their local problems. The problem with the, the George Bush phrase, a thousand points of light, for me was twofold. The one was that um, it became a cosmetic phrase. Mm -hmm. It was never really integrated in what the administration was about. Mm -hmm. And the other is that a thousand points of light is too small. We're mm -hmm. talking about 250 million points of light. As mm -hmm. you said, we're talking about each one of us doing something. And then it becomes contagious and it becomes like an addiction, a positive addiction. Mm -hmm. I know when I started volunteering, I had no idea how much I would get back. And that's why um, we now produce through this partnership of children that I founded, a um, directory called Kid Power, about encouraging children to volunteer. Mm -hmm. One of our sayings is families that volunteer together stay together. You know, mm -hmm. like families go to the zoo on a Sunday. Mm -hmm. What about going to a soup kitchen? I've taken my three-year-old to soup kitchens, and it's amazing what happens to children. It's as though they know they're doing something important mm -hmm. when they put the, bro the bread roll on the tray. Mm -hmm. And it's important for them to realize how many children are going hungry. Mm -hmm. They begin to value what they have more. Ariana, I'm sitting here, and I, I, you know, we're, we've both made a couple bucks in our life. We're doing pretty well. What would you do if you lost all your money and your husband lost all his money? What would you do? I would do exactly what I'm doing. I, I've never worked. Uh, harder than uh, after I married a millionaire. Really? <laughs> throwing parties? That's what people are saying at home. They're saying she must have worked harder throwing parties. No, they, I, the parties that I throw now are actually called critical mass dinners. And they are centered around this theme of volunteering and changing the welfare state. Mm -hmm. I believe very strongly that if you get 20 people around a table, some of whom may be congressmen and senators and some of whom may be running, volunteer centers like Martha's Table in Washington or Hannah Hawkins whom I recently had at one of those dinners who runs um, a center for youth at risk in Anacostia, one of the most dangerous areas in Washington DC. If you mix those people together and they begin to talk about these things, something good will come out of it. So how, even my entertaining now is centered around this idea. How, how big a hit did your husband take? I heard he spent 28 million on this campaign, is that right? He did, and over Thanksgiving, we were on a friend's boat, which cost exactly the same amount of money. Our friend spent $28 million building this fabulous boat. This was its maiden voyage. And my husband feels very glad that he spent his $28 million promoting the ideas that he believes in rather than building a boat. I mean, that was another choice he could have had. Yeah, I would have built the boat, but I understand, <laughs> I understand your point of view, absolutely. I'd have been on that boat in a minute. Uh, well, we can be on the boat without building. <laughs> uh, but is this a big hit? I mean, he's not on welfare now or anything, right? Not he's yet. okay. He's, uh, he's okay. How are you okay. going to volunteer? Uh, you? No, <laughs> I, I nothing to do with politics. I. What do you think of the Perot factor? 
Uh, I think the Perot factor was not the Perot factor. As we saw from this election, what is happening is much more fundamental. It's really a turning point. It's the end of um, the whole New Deal, great society mentality. It's the mm -hmm. end of an era. We don't exactly know what the new era is going to be like. I just hope and pray that Newt Gingrich and Dick Armey and Bob Dole are going to be brave enough and courageous enough to go on and deliver what they promised the American electorate. Because if they don't, we're in real trouble. And then we may have a third party, just because the American electorate will be so fed up with more promises that were not delivered. Will the media try to destroy Newt Gingrich? Absolutely, unquestionably. And I think Newt Gingrich needs to start having a strategy about what he's going to do. He can't just let it happen. In a campaign, if you think of it, you do respond to your attacks. You know, you either put on 30-second commercials or you take on ads in the newspapers. Uh, you do something. During the time of governing, there is no process for him other than going on the Sunday morning talk shows or something mm -hmm. like that to be responding to everything. And there has to be. In your opinion, will they succeed in destroying him? No. They won't succeed because um, he represents uh, something very powerful. As you may remember that great phrase, there is nothing as powerful as an idea whose time has come. And he represents that idea. And that's why they won't be able to destroy him. But why should we make it easy for them? Those of us who care about the same ideas that Newt cares about need to help him make sure that everything is answered. Will your husband run again? He'll probably run again. Another 28 mil? <laughs> Think it over. I'll, uh, I'll help you, and we'll just get a $16 million boat, okay? And we can spend the rest on the campaign. All right, I got to wrap it up here, Ariana. Thanks for being with us. In the name of the book, The Fourth Instinct, you can pick it up at the bookstores. Simon and Schuster, Ariana Huffington. Thank thanks you. Thanks for Roger. being here. Thank you. And now you stay with us. Uh, we'll be back in just a minute with a very, very interesting subject, one that is very close to my head, heart, heart. <laughs>